Dear friends, the Lord be with you. Good morning and welcome to Calvin Church on this Lord's Day. It's good for us to be here together to worship God, who graciously invites us always to worship. This morning we're especially glad to celebrate our GEMS and Cadets ministries. These are Wednesday night ministries for girls and boys here at Calvin Church, and they will be leading us in parts of our worship this morning, um, so we're grateful for that, grateful to celebrate what God is doing through those ministries. After worship this morning, the third through eighth grade church school classes will meet as usual, and the high school catechism class and the adult education class will be combined for a time of studying the catechism further uh, using Craig Barnes' book, Body and Soul. So ninth grade and up, you're welcome to join us in the adult education room at 11.30. I wanna draw your attention to another bulletin announcement, which is on the book study group that's being formed um, to discuss You Are What You Love by Jamie Smith. Um, please sign up for that book group by next week Sunday. If you are interested, you can do that by talking with Pastor Lynette or by signing up at the table in the narthex. Um, do that by next week Sunday if you'd like to join that book group. Uh, I wanna take a moment to introduce a new member to Calvin Church. Some of you met her last summer when she made her adult affirmation of faith. I'm talking about Sophia Bryson. Sophia, will you stand? Um, and let's give her a warm Calvin Church welcome. Sophia has been involved here for some time as a Calvin College student and as a leader in some of our youth ministries, um, and we're delighted to welcome her officially as a member now. Welcome, Sophia. Our children's choirs also lead us in worship this morning. Let's prepare our hearts as they call us to worship now. Thank you. 
God has called us to worship and now greets us. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Friends, as we come to worship this morning, we come to worship the one and only holy God. And we admit that left to ourselves and to our own devices, we would be dead in our sin. And as 1 John 1 says, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. So this morning, we'll take some time and confess our sin together to the God who sets us free. Pray with me, please. Our Father in heaven, we thank you that you have led us into the light. We thank you for sending the Savior to call us from death to life. And we confess that we were dead in sin before we heard his call. But when we heard him, like Lazarus, we arose. But, O oh, Father, the grave clothes still bind us. Old habits we cannot throw off, old customs that are so much a part of our lives that we are helpless, we feel helpless to live the new life Christ calls us to live. So give us strength, mighty God, to live new life in you. Give us faith to believe that with you we cannot fail. And all this we ask in the name of our Savior, Jesus, who has taught us to come to you. Amen. But when we come to God, we are forgiven. We are set free by the person and work of Jesus Christ. And to hear some of that assurance this morning, we're going to um, say together part of the Heidelberg Catechism. It's question and answer 34. I'll ask the question and then together we'll read the answer. Why do you call him Jesus our Lord? Because not with gold or silver, but with his precious blood, he has set us free from sin and from the tyranny of the devil and has bought us body and soul to be his very own. Friends, in Jesus Christ, we are forgiven, we are set free. Amen.
Let's continue our worship in the assurance of our forgiveness uh, by standing, if you're able, and saying together the Apostles' Creed printed in the front page of the hymnal. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting.
Good morning. It's good to see all of you up here singing your song and hearing your voices. It's beautiful. Thank you. Well, we're going to highlight our GEMS program and our cadets program. And I'm going to tell everybody a little bit about what we do in our GEMS meetings. Um, our theme this year is Be a Blessing. And um, through that, we are learning what a blessing is and how to bless others. Um, and in our GEMS meetings, we have three W's that we, we do. We worship together. We listen to God's word together. And then we wonder together. So when we worship together, we do lots of fun singing and dancing down in the basement. It gets a little loud sometimes. It's kind of like a dance party, but it's a lot of fun. And our word this year is 2 Corinthians. And I'm going to read that for you right now. Our word is, and God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things and at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. The wonder part of our GEMS meetings is how can we apply this to our lives? What does this first mean? Well, we've picked it apart a little bit so far this year. In this word abundantly is a big word. So we talked a lot about that word abundantly and what it means. So I've got something for you today. Okay, I need everybody to put your hands out in front of you, just like a little cup. I've got something for everyone, so just hold your hands out and just watch carefully, okay? You're so patient. Lucy got a lot, didn't she? <laughs> she didn't know that was going to happen. She got an abundance of kisses from me. Now, gems and cadets and children, do you think, hold on to your one kiss, Lucy's got all the rest, do you think Lucy should keep the abundance of kisses to herself? <laughs> no. I blessed her with so many kisses, didn't I? What do you think Lucy should do with all those kisses? Share them. <laughs> you're right. I don't think Lucy's mom and dad want her to eat all those kisses. Yes, you're right. She should share them. And all of us up here, all of us in our congregation, we are abundantly blessed by God. God wants us to give back, and God wants us to bless others with all that we have. All right, well, the, um, the cadet program also has Be a Blessing as our theme this year. Um, and in addition to that, we have our landmarks that we always go through. There's four of them, the cadet motto, the cadet verse, the cadet code, and the cadet pledge. So unlike the gems that have cool alliteration and they have a, pr a program they do with that, we just basically do the landmarks and then do cool stuff each time we meet. And uh, aside from making sure our uniforms try to look sharp, that's pretty much what we do. Um, but uh, the being a blessing and the landmarks are all connected. So I would like this point, uh, all of the cadets to stand up. What is the cadet motto? Now a little louder. Living for Jesus. Good. What is the cadet verse? Exactly. You guys can sit down. At ease. Thank you. Um, 
So um, we, we go through the landmarks, we do cool stuff, we talk about what it is to be a good Christian person, and these things, kids, are all connected. You can be a blessing because we've been blessed by God, as you've just seen. Um, if you love God, then you will live for Him, and that's our motto. And the way you live for Him is to obey His commandments, so that's our verse. So I want you all to continue thinking about that and connect those things. Um, and at this point, I think we are ready um, for you to all stand, and we'll get the blessing from the congregation. Everybody can stand. People of God, what is your prayer for these children? Praise God, and thank you, Gems and Cadets, for your leadership this morning. This morning, we remember in prayer the family of Reverend Roger Van Harn, who died yesterday morning. At Calvin Church, that includes his son, Carl Van Harn, and Joanna, and Joseph, and Miriam, and his sister-in-law, Fran Hamstra. We give thanks for Roger's life and for the hope we have in the resurrection, and we pray for comfort for Roger's family in their grief. You can find funeral information and arrangements in the obituary tomorrow. And this morning, we pray for Jim Portinga, who has recently been diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. So we pray for Jim as he adjusts to this diagnosis and as he continues to deal with these symptoms. Let us pray. O 
O oh God, our creator, our redeemer, and our sustainer, forever faithful, abounding in steadfast love and mercy, hear our prayer. You promise to hear our prayers in the name of Jesus Christ, and in the confidence that he himself is praying for us, we come before you today with our prayers of thanksgiving and intercession. We see your grace given to us in so many ordinary ways, Lord. We confess that we lose sight of how extraordinary these gifts really are. We thank you for sunshine when it breaks through the long winter, for food that nourishes us and tastes good, for the embrace of someone who loves us, for music that can inspire us, for friends who understand us, and for so many more rich and routine blessings. You promise to care for us as a father has compassion on his children, and we trust in your love. Gracious God, we thank you for providing for your church through the ages. As we live out the life of your body in the world here at Calvin Church, we ask that you would open us to the guidance of your Holy Spirit. Show us your mission in the world here in our neighborhood and in our homes and workplaces. Strengthen the work of the East Town Community Association. We thank you for the pancake breakfast that was held here at Calvin Church yesterday and we ask that your mercy and justice would be known in the streets and homes and businesses of this neighborhood, and that you would bless Calvin Church through our location and bless our location through us. Thank you for the ministries of Gems and Cadets. Bless and strengthen each of these girls and boys with a growing knowledge of you and of your love for them. Hear our prayers for the nation of Venezuela. We pray for wisdom for the leaders engaged in conflict and crisis. And we pray for the ordinary citizens who are affected by this crisis. Protect them, Lord, and provide a way forward. Give wisdom to leaders of other countries as they seek the best ways to relate to Venezuelan leadership. We pray that peace would reign. God of mercy, show your comfort and grace to the Van Harn family, to Jim Portinga, to Jim Fridsma, to Shirley Weersing, to all who are dealing with grief or illness of body or mind, to all who are lonely or who are struggling. Care for those in our own city who do not have electrical power, as our mayor and governor declared a state of emergency, we thank you for all of the first responders and electrical company workers who are working hard, and we ask that you would protect them and protect all of us. As we walk with you each day, Lord, we pray to you, Savior, like a shepherd, lead us. Much we need your tender care. In your pleasant pastures, feed us. For our use, your fold prepare. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, you have bought us, yours we are. We are yours, in love befriend us. Be the guardian of our way. Keep your flock, from sin defend us. Seek us when we go astray. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, hear your children when we pray. In your name, blessed Jesus, we pray. Amen.
Our scripture reading this morning comes from John chapter 3, verses 1 through 17, which can be found on page 863 of your pew Bibles. Before we read, let us go to our God in prayer. Lord, we thank you for giving us your word. We, pr we pray that you would enlighten us through your servant, Pastor Brad, this morning to receive it. Amen. John chapter 3. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh and what is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. This is the word of the Lord. We are in the midst of a sermon series here at Calvin Church. This is three of six happening every other week on and around the Heidelberg Catechism. Um, and it ties in with our adult education time after the service, which Pastor Rebecca mentioned in the welcome. Um, and this is part, like I said, part three of that, where the catechism goes through the first part of the Apostles' Creed and especially looks at um, the person and the work of Jesus Christ. So uh, what, what better passage to look at the person and work of Jesus Christ and the love of God than this one from John 3. There's a detail here in John 3, in verse 2, that is fascinating. Nicodemus, a well-respected leader among the Pharisees comes to talk to Jesus at night. Why at night? Some readers and interpreters of Scripture think it's because Nicodemus is scared. He is a prestigious man, especially in the Jewish community, and he'd rather not have that reputation tarnished by going to speak to this up-and-comer Jesus. So he goes to Jesus under the cover of night when no one, hopefully, will see him or hear him. Others have suggested that Nicodemus comes to Jesus at, at night because it's the best chance to talk to Jesus alone. No crowds of people, no annoying disciples, no other Pharisees or scribes, no Sadducees, no one to take the discussion this way and that. Just Nicodemus and Jesus 
Two people devoted to the Word of God, hashing it out. And there's a third suggestion. Maybe John tells us that Nicodemus uh, comes to Jesus at night for one, of the, for one of the two reasons I just mentioned, uh, but perhaps the detail is also in the text because John likes the contrast. At night, in the dark, Nicodemus seeks out the light of the world. At night, in the dark, Nicodemus seeks out the light of the world. Leslie Newbegin, who was a 20th century uh, missionary, pastor, theologian, he spent a lot of time in India and then the, the later part of his life back in the UK. He puts it this way, Nicodemus comes to Jesus at night because he is drawn to the light but is unable to leave the darkness. And wow, what a picture, right? What a picture of the human condition, of the place that you and me and the whole world find ourselves. Drawn to the light, but unable to leave the darkness. Yearning, aching for salvation, but unable by our own efforts to drag ourselves toward heaven and toward God. Do those who look for their salvation in saints, in themselves, or elsewhere, really believe in the only Savior, Jesus? The Heidelberg Catechism asks that question in question and answer 30. Do those who look for their salvation in saints, in themselves, or elsewhere, really believe in the only Savior, Jesus? And it answers with a resounding no, period. And then goes on to add, Either Jesus is not a perfect Savior, or those who in true faith accept this Savior have in him all they need for salvation. But it's a part of our sinful human nature to forget that we can't do it ourselves, or to imagine that we can work our way into our own rescue, work our own way toward God. Remember the people in Genesis 11 trying to build a tower that reaches heaven? Or remember uh, the king of Babylon in Isaiah 14 who claims that he can ascend to heaven on his own and become on par with the Most High God? Or remember the friend who tries to crawl out of his mess all by himself time and time again without accepting any help? Or remember the coworker who tells you that really peace and God are found within? And we could keep going with other examples of, of other people ignoring the need for a savior, but if you're honest, with yourself, and if I'm honest with myself, we do it too. We self-help, self-correct, self-soothe, self-medicate, self-save all the time. But back to Nicodemus for a moment. He's so confused when Jesus tells him that to see the kingdom of God, uh, which is just another way of saying to receive eternal life, one must be born anew or born from above. How can anyone be born after growing old, Nicodemus asks. We can just hear him say it. How can anyone be born after having grown old? How can all the doubts and uncertainties and insecurities and wishes and hopes and joys and fears and actions and habits be undone? How can you ever have new life? Jesus answers Nicodemus with 
a, a number of images and analogies that basically come down to this. New life, being born anew, is only possible by the creative power of God. New life, being born anew, is only possible by the creative power of God. The same creative God who breathed life into the world, who breathed life into you when you were born, can breathe new life into you by the Holy Spirit. Only God makes new life possible. Only God makes new life possible. That's what it means to be born anew or born from above, to be gifted new life by the Creator God. It's always a mystery, this new life, always a miracle, always, always God. This um, has never been so clear to me uh, than when I heard the story of a Cambodian man who survived the genocide of Pol Pot in the late 1970s. Everything that this man had seen and lived through and experienced, uh, the murder of his parents, um, death camps, the destruction of his country, all of this, how could anyone function after that? How could anyone go on living a normal life, much less have a new lease on life? How is life possible after that much death? And how is e even eternal life possible after that much death? But as I sat on the floor, on the dirt floor of this man's Cambodian home and heard him say that after the loss of his parents, he felt the overwhelming love of his heavenly parent. Or heard him say that in the refugee camp that he finally escaped to in Thailand, he was loved and cared for and, and um, fed by these Christians in the refugee camp. When I heard him talk about these things and saw him in front of me, I felt as though I was hearing really an absolute miracle, the story of someone who knew, who really knew deep in his bones, new life, who had somehow, some way, been born again. Leslie Newbegin, the same person I quoted earlier, says this, the descent of Jesus into the depths of our sin and death is paradoxically but truly the lifting up, the glorifying which leads to the victory of life over death. The victory of life over death. But we can only know this by listening to the testimony of those who have followed this way. And as I listened to this man's story, I witnessed, I heard the creative power of God. I witnessed, I heard the power of life over death. I heard, I witnessed new life, salvation found in Jesus. Friends of God, we cannot save ourselves. We cannot give ourselves new life. But Jesus Christ can and has and does. That is the gospel truth. But you can't preach this text without, of course, mentioning John 3, 16. So I'd like to just say that there's a reason this verse is the most well-known verse in Scripture. There's a reason that it's held up on signs 
at sporting events. There's a reason you see it all over the place. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but may have eternal life. Any notion we might have that Jesus Christ is an afterthought or a, or a plan B has to go away when we hear John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. God has always loved this world and always will. Despite the darkness, despite our sin, despite the things we think make us and this world utterly unlovable. In his book, Body and Soul, the, the book on the Heidelberg Catechism that we're using to kind of guide us through the catechism, Craig Barnes says, the birth of the Savior was not an afterthought. From the beginning, the triune God has been the creative force in our life, saving us from darkness and chaos. God has always loved you and always will. Despite the darkness, despite your sin, despite whatever it is you think makes you utterly unlovable. From the beginning, the triune God has been the creative force in your life, saving you from darkness and chaos. And in Jesus, God gives you and me and the whole world the gift of eternal life, the gift of life with God now, now, and forevermore. The Catechism says it like this in question and answer 37. During his whole life on earth, but especially at the end, Christ sustained in body and soul the wrath of God against the sin of the whole human race. This he did in order that by his suffering, as the only atoning sacrifice, he might deliver us body and soul, he might deliver us body and soul from eternal condemnation and gain for us God's grace, righteousness, and eternal life. In Jesus, God gives you and me and the whole world the gift of eternal life, life with God now and forevermore. It's Nicodemus who began our journey into the text this morning. So let's end with him too. Yes, Nicodemus comes to talk to Jesus at night. But it's not the last we hear of Nicodemus, actually. In John 19.39, after Jesus has been crucified, we hear this. Nicodemus, who had first come to Jesus by night, also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about a hundred pounds. Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea take Jesus' body and they bury him. With all of Jesus' disciples scattered, it's Nicodemus, this Nicodemus who came to Jesus at night, who cares for the body of Jesus and, in fact, gives him a burial fit for, king, fit for a king. He brings with him a mixture of myrrh and aloes. And this is interesting because in Psalm 45, you find this messianic psalm and I want to read verses 6 through 8. Your throne, O God, endures forever and ever. Your royal scepter is a scepter of equity. You love righteousness and hate wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you, talking about 
the Messiah, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. Your robes are all fragrant with myrrh and aloes and cassia. Nicodemus, who had first come to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about a hundred pounds. Nicodemus gives Jesus a burial fit for kings, fit even, according to Psalm 45, for a Messiah. No one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above, Jesus says to Nicodemus in John 3. But the fact that Nicodemus now buries Jesus in the manner of kings says that perhaps his darkness no longer keeps him from the light. He sees Jesus as king. He sees the kingdom of God. He has been born from above. He has new life. He has eternal life. And by the grace of God, so do each of you. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Will you pray with me, please? Gracious God, thank you. Thank you for your goodness to us. And it's our prayer this morning, it's my prayer this morning, that each person here experiences and knows new life by your Spirit. That we would all be born again, born from above. You make this all possible, Lord. Create in us new life. As we drown in our own sin, move around in darkness, Lord, you bring us light. You bring us salvation. Thank you so much. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Today's Minute for Missions focus is on Forgotten Man Ministries. The mission is to follow in Christ's footsteps by bringing the healing powers of the great physician to those incarcerated in Michigan jails. Forgotten Man Ministries brings together inmates, chaplains, and workers to study God's word. The chaplains conduct daily in-house jail ministries that include biblical one-on-one -on -one counseling, Bible study courses, group Bible studies, and facilitating pastor visits and worship services led by local churches. Their goal is to provide significant and lasting development of spiritual muscle to inmates impacting both their earthly and eternal lives, hopefully resulting in them becoming better spouses, parents, employees, and citizens. As the trend continues to grow for those in jail or prison, the needs of Forgotten Man Ministries are great. They request our prayers and financial support. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this ministry. Please open the hearts of inmates to receive your word and accept Jesus as their Savior. We pray for those who minister to wayward souls in jail and ask that you give them strength, energy, and patience. Finally, Lord, we pray for peace and comfort for all affected by crime throughout your world. In your name we pray, amen.
People of God, would you rise to receive a blessing from the God who loves you? Friends, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each and every one of you. Amen.